Hello, who'll read it? For Key Stage 2, this week I will be reading Malamanda, which was CBBC Book of the Month by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 1 is called The Grand Nautilus Hotel. My name's Herbert Lennon, by the way, but most people call me Herbie. I'm the lost and founder at the Grand Nautilus Hotel. As you can see from my cap, someone once told me that most hotels don't have a lost and founder, but that can't be right. What do they do with all the lost stuff then? And how do people who've lost it get it back? I'm a bit young for such an important job, I suppose, but Lady Kraken herself, the owner of the hotel, gave it to me. Even Mr Mollusk, the hotel manager, can't argue with that. He'd like to, of course. He hates anything in the hotel that doesn't make money. If he'd had his way, the lost and foundry would have been shut down as soon as he became manager and my little cubby hole in the reception lobby boarded up for good. And if that had happened, I'd have never have met the girl. The girl I found scrambling through my window. The girl who said, hide me, hide me. I look her up and down, well, mostly up, because she got herself stuck on the window latch and the cellar window, windows are near the ceiling. If she's a burglar, She's not a very good one. Please! I get her unstuck, although that means nearly being squashed as she tumbles inside. It's snowing, so a whole lot of winter comes in through the window too. We get to our feet now and I'm face to face with her. A girl in a ratty pullover with a woolly bobble hat over a mass of curly hair. She looks like she's about to speak, but stops at the sound of raised voices up above. Raised voices that are getting closer. The girl opens her eyes wide with panic. I'm here, I whisper, and pull her over to the large travel trunk that's been in the Lost and Foundry unclaimed for decades. Before she can say anything, I shove her inside and close the lid. The voices are right up at my cubby hole now. The whining, wielding sound of Mr Mollusk trying to deal with someone difficult. I grab a few lost bags, brollies and bits and dump them on top of the trunk and hope that they look as if they've been there for years. Then the bell on my counter, the one people ring when they want my attention, starts tingling-a-linging like crazy. I straighten my cap, run up the steps to my cubby hole and turn my how can I help you face on as if nothing strange has happened at all. Mr Mollusk, Mollusk is the first person I see, trying to smooth his hair over his bald patch. I'm sure it's a misunderstanding he's spluttering to someone. If you would just allow me to make inquiries... The someone he's talking to is unlike anyone I've ever seen. It's a man in a long black sailor's coat that's sodden with water. He looms over the desk like a crooked monolith, his face a dismal crag, his eyes hidden beneath the peak of a ruined captain's cap. With one stiff finger, he's jabbing the button of my bell like he's stabbing it with a knife. He stops when I arrive and leans in even further, covering me in shadow. Where? he says in a voice that sounds like two slabs of wet granite scraping together. Girl, where? <clears throat> I say, clearing my throat and putting on a posh voice. Mr. Malosk expects me to use with guests. To who may you be referring, sir? The man's mouth, which is nothing more than a wide upside down bee, is dripping in bone, uh, is a dripping bone yellow beard. He opens with a hiss. I notice there is seaweed in that beard and more tangled around his tarnished brass buttons. He smells like something bad's about to happen. Where? I gulp. Well, I can't help it, can I? I'm just a lost property attendant. I'm not trained for this. My dear sir, hears the voice of Mr Mollusk. I'm sure we can sort this out. What exactly have you lost? The man pulls himself back out of my cubby hole and towers over Mr Mollusk. He draws his right hand, which has been hidden until now, out of his coat. Mr Mollusk shrinks back when he sees that where the man's hand should be is a large iron boat hook, ending in a long, gleaming spike. Girl, says the man. Now one thing I will say about Mr Mollusk is that he knows which battles to fight. In this case, since there was no way he could beat this great hulking intruder, he decides to join him instead and turns on me. Herbert Lemon, have you got a girl down there? Now they, but they were both looming at me. I shake my head. My how may I help you face dissolves, so I try an innocent grin instead. No, 
I managed to say in a squeaky voice. I hate it when my voice does that. No girls are hiding down here, none at all. And that's when there's a soft thud down in the basement behind me. It sounds exactly like someone who's hiding in a travel trunk trying to make themselves more comfortable. Oops. The bearded sailor opens his mouth in a moan of triumph. His dark eyes flash beneath his cap. He yanks open the door to my cubby hole, shoves me against the wall as he pushes past, and he squeezes down the steps to the cellar, filling the tunnel, his back crooked as he stoops beneath the low ceiling. I hurry after him. This isn't me being brave, by the way. This is just me not knowing what else to do. The sailor is standing in the middle of the room, filling the space. I see him look at the patch of melted snow beneath the open cellar window. I see him turn his head to follow the wet footprints that lead straight to the travel trunk. The bags and brollies I dumped on there have fallen off. By now there might as well be a big flashing sign over the trunk saying, Yoo-hoo! She's in here! Mr Mollusk, rushing down to join the party, sees all this too and grows crimson with rage. Herbert Lemon, why I ought to... But what he ought to, what he ought to, I don't find out because of what the sailor with a spike for a hand does next. He raises his spike and brings it down with a sickening thud, driving it deep into the lid of the chest. The lid of the trunk splits and sunders with each blow, splinters of wood raining down all around. The trunk itself begins to disintegrate. The man tears the rest of it open with the help of one of his good hand, to reveal nothing. Well, not quite nothing. There's a very surprised looking spider sitting amongst the wreckage and a wobbly bobble hat. I watch the spider scurry away and wish I could join it. Now, all there is to look at is the hat. It's very definitely the brightly coloured hat the girl was wearing, but there was no sign of the girl. With a slow, deliberate motion, Boat Hook Man skewers the hat on the tip of his spike. He turns and holds it out to me, his face like a thundercloud. Somehow I find the courage not to squeak as I reach out and gently take the hat off the hook. Just some lost property, I say. It was um, handed in this morning. I haven't had a chance to label it yet, that's all. There was a moment of silence. Then Boat Hook Man roars, a great wordless bellow of fury. He starts ransacking my cellar, sweeping his massive arms from side to side. I fall back on the stairs as bags, coats, hats and lost thingamy doodars of every kind, including some that have must have lain undisturbed down here since almost forever, fly about and the man goes berserk trying to find the girl. But he finds no one. She's gone. Chapter 2 tomorrow is called Violet Palmer.